Bezalel's God-given talents. Bezalel's God-given talents. So who was Bezalel? Well, maybe before this morning you had no idea who Bezalel was. If you've been obviously coming to this church for a while, I've preached on Bezalel previously. But he's not the most famous character in the Bible, but he's important nonetheless. And um, you know, I like the character in the Bible because of the principles that he reminds me of. And those are two of the principles that I'm going to go over this morning and hopefully encourage you uh, this morning. So if he had a, if he had a more... Uh, socially normal sounding name i might have named one of my sons after him but bezalil so it's a bit <laughs> a bit odd what would you call him like here bezzy hey little bezzy bezzy bez bez um it's funny because like you know in uh, some in churches where there's many generations of christians you know, people are using names from the bible you don't have to obviously name your children after names in the bible but what happens is like you start running out of names and then that's when they start going, they start finding more obscure names in the Bible. And then you start getting kids to grow up with like some of the more obscure names in the Bible. And, uh, you know, sometimes when you find one, you're like, ooh, this is one that somebody hasn't used yet. And it's a nice name. I always find that really funny. So who is Bezalel? Bezalel, we saw in Exodus 35, he was the man that God used under Moses to lead basically the, the, the tabernacle building project. If that makes sense. Like he basically was the main guy that built most of the things. In town. He wasn't the only one that built them. He had other sort of, I guess, managers alongside him and many other people helped. But he was instrumental in building all the things that was part of the tabernacle. Now, what was the tabernacle? So the, ta the word tabernacle is just another word for the word tent, right? So it's, it was a tent, right? And the tabernacle was something that God had com commanded Moses to build, um, which would signify where God dwelt, right? And the dwelling place of God, that's where they would sac do sacrifices, that's where the priests would minister, um, and it was intentionally uh, a tent, we see that, because of the sort of temporary nature of it. But the things that Moses, God commanded Moses to build within the tabernacle actually represented things that were in heaven. So he actually told Moses, I want you to build everything as I showed you in the mount. When he went up to, to Mount Sinai, he actually saw everything and then was commanded to, to make everything as like a sort of earth, earthly replica of the spiritual. So in Exodus 25 is where God actually commands Moses to build this tabernacle. It says here, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart, ye shall take my offering. So from like sort of 25 to the rest of Exodus, a lot of very specific descriptions of what is in this tabernacle and what is being made. And um, what is he talking about here? He's saying when they're going to make this tabernacle, uh, you know, churches often will use these sort of passages, you know, when they want to say sort of have a building project or do something big. It's like, hey, uh, here's a passage where it was the call was sent out to the people to say, hey, bring in the resources, right? Bring in the jewels and the cloth and all the people that need to do the work. And, and that's what God is saying here. He's saying, hey, we need, we need to build this tabernacle, put the call out that people to bring this offering. And people gave it voluntarily and willingly. Of it and and what's really encouraging about when they put the call out to build this tabernacle the bible actually tells us in another chapter and i don't have it in my notes but it says the stuff that they had was sufficient and too much you know so people were so willing to give to the project of god that they had more than they need they actually had to start turning people away and say hey stop bringing it because we've got enough now to, to do this i mean would to god that every church was in that situation where churches had to turn things away because too much is coming in but unfortunately, a lot of churches are not in that situation. But people should have a heart to do that, um, like we see here in, in the nation of Israel back in the days here. Speak unto the children of Israel that they bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart. Ye shall take my offering. And this is the offering which ye shall take of, of them. Gold and silver and brass and blue and purple. So you can see these all, uh, you, know, um, you know, different materials to, to build the house of God. And and um you know there, there's a spiritual obviously application to this too that see how everyone plays a part in building the house of god it's not just oh, only the priests have to go you know and work and bring in all the stuff and make sure everything's it's like everyone who has a wise heart has the materials they're all they all play their part to build the house of god and that's the picture of, of 
of soul winning, right? That's the picture of evangelism, where it's not just for a few people, it's everyone's job to take part in that work where we build the house of God. And we are like, the Bible says, lively stones built up a temple to God. So you see how that picture of everyone coming together to build the house of God, it's everyone's job to try and get people saved, get them in church, get them growing. And as we continue to do this work, blue and purple, scarlet, fine linen, goat's hair, ram skins, dyed red, badger skins, shit and wood, oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil, for, and for sweet incense, onyx stones and stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate. Notice that, see, when God makes his house here, I mean, they're not doing it on the cheap. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's like this, this idea that, hey, we give the best to God and God's temple was something glorious and it had, you know, it had nice jewels and everything like that. And in the New Testament, you know, we're not focusing on a physical place, right? But it's about, you know, bring, being the best Christian for God. Yeah, we talk about, okay, the church needs some physical things and you know, sometimes churches, people always you know, donate the stuff that they don't want anymore, stuff that's like broken or maybe church can use it. You know, <laughs> the food they don't want, maybe church can use it. The leftovers, you know, we shouldn't have that mindset, right? We should always try and do the best for God and have good things for God. But think about, we are the lively stones. We are what make God's house you know, we ourselves don't want to give God our second best. We don't want to be like this, you know, broken thing that is part of this house, right, in terms of, like, spiritually. So think about the sort of stone that you want to be as part of this house, you know, and we want these, God's house to be glorious, right, and, we, and we're what make that. Let them make a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. According to all that, according to all that I show thee, after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall ye make it. So this is when he's saying to Moses, hey, you've seen it in the mount. I want you to make it exactly like you saw it, but on earth, because it's going to represent that heavenly thing. And then in Hebrews 9, we're kind of given a lot of the significance of the tabernacle and what it meant, right? And how it relates to Jesus Christ. So Hebrews 9, we'll just read through this quickly. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service. So that's the covenant that he's talking about in Moses' day. And a worldly sanctuary. So what does that mean? The world, worldly there doesn't mean that it's like, you know, lusts of the flesh, lusts of the eye, the pride of life. It means it was on earth, right? For there was a tabernacle made, so that's the tent, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all. So you can see that, you know, it's, it's like a series of tents, that they, that they would go, and then you had the, the sanctuary, then the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. So that's the Ark of the Covenant that had the, the you see the description, it's sort of something they kind of carried um, with the, 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 the poles and the loops. But inside that, it's telling us what was inside it. And over it, the cherubims of glory, shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. So on that mercy seat represented the presence of God. You had the cherubims with their wings covering the mercy seat, and that's representative of God dwelling between the cherubims in heaven. And, and, and I've preached before that. I believe Satan was, was one of those cherubims, but he fell when he sinned. Now, when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone, once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. The Holy Ghost is signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. So you can see how the, this tabernacle built on earth was to remind people that God has a presence and we couldn't go into his presence because the veil was there and while that tabernacle was still standing, it had not yet been fulfilled that there was a way to get into that holiest of all because the priest had to go in, which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. So we read a lot of those in the book of Leviticus. 
by Christ being come and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. So you see how it's comparing what was on earth versus what was in heaven, and it's saying Jesus Christ, you know, was that priest for us. But he didn't bring in the blood, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For of the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead work to serve the living and to serve the living God. What's that saying there? It's saying that if they had all these Old Testament practices that sort of made them clean in the flesh so that they can go into the tabernacle, they're saying how much more does the blood of Christ cleanse us if that's what you know, physical bulls and goats and their blood and ashes did uh, in terms of physically purifying them in order for them to be able to go into that tabernacle. And of course, when Jesus died and he rose again, you remember when he died, the, the veil of the temple was rent. Right? Does that signify that there was no longer a veil between God and the people? Jesus ha ha was that mediator which allows us to then boldly go into that throne of grace and obtain help in time of need. So that's the significance of the tabernacle. Now, some interesting things about the tabernacle, just on this point of what the tabernacle is, is that God actually, uh, you know how David later on, through Solomon, actually built a temple and I believe that God actually never intended for that temple to be built. That was something that David had in his heart and David, uh, God allowed David and Solomon to do um, and, and blessed their work, just like our work is blessed, but it was never something that was originally intended by God. Um, and it kind of gives us the reason why. I kind of alluded to it before, but I want to show you here how I believe David misunderstood what God had said to him and thought that he was talking about Solomon, right? When God was actually talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. So 1 Chronicles 17, this is when David, uh, and it's in 1 Samuel as well, but this is where David kind of gets the idea that he wants to build this temple for God. So he wants to replace the tabernacle, which was a tent, right? And he, and he wants to build an actual, uh, like a physical building, right? Like a, a permanent building. Now it came to pass as David sat in his house that David said to Nathan the prophet, Lo, I dwell in a house of cedars, but the ark of the covenant of the Lord remaineth under curtains. Right? Then Nathan, so he's looking at his house, he's saying, Look, I've got a house of like wood and like stone and stuff, but it's like, but the ark of the covenant, hey, it's in a tent. So he's like looking at the difference, saying, Hey, why, why do I have it so good? And the ark of the covenant has like this, uh, this older tent, you know, that he would uh, not think is as glorious. Then Nathan said unto David, Do all that is in thine heart, for God is with thee. Now this just goes to show that even men of God, right, can, 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 can condone something. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's the right thing to do. Right? Because look at, Nathan says, hey, well do it. Hey, God is with you. So he's just assuming that, hey, it's a godly person. Hey, anything he does must be the right thing to do. And, and this is a good lesson that we ought not be like that in any instance, even in church. Sometimes, you know, people are in a church and they just assume the pastor's always right. You know, as they say, oh, oh, another godly person, that, that they're always right. They think, hey, they're doing it. It must be okay to do, right? This is what Nathan's kind of saying here. He's saying, hey, do all that is in thy heart. Hey, God is with you. So he's just assuming that everything that David wants to do is the will of God. But was that the case? And it came to pass the same night that the word of God came to Nathan saying, Go and tell David my servant, thus saith the Lord, thou shalt not build me a house to dwell in. Right? For I have not dwelt in a house since the day that I brought up Israel unto this day, but have gone from tent to tent. So you see how that's the tabernacle. You say tabernacle's a tent. The Bible actually explains that it's a tent. I've gone from tent to tent, from one tabernacle to another. Wheresoever I have walked with all Israel, Spake I a word to any of the judges of Israel whom I commanded to feed my people, saying, Why have ye not built me a house of cedars? So you see how God's saying, Hey, you're not going to build me a house. In fact, I never even, I've never asked for a house. Have I ever asked for a house to be built? And maybe he's talking about moving from tent to tent because maybe it just wears down and they build a new one. It wears down and they build a new one. Um, but it's still that same pattern that it was, a, it was a tabernacle. It wasn't a building. Now therefore, thus shalt thou say unto my servant David, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, 
I took thee from the sheep coat, even from following the sheep, that thou shouldest be ruler over my people Israel. So he's talking about how he raised David up from being a, you know, just a shepherd to the king of his people. And I have been with thee, whithersoever thou hast walked, and have cut off all thine enemies from before thee, and have made thee a name like the name of the great men that are in the earth. Also, I will ordain a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, and they shall dwell in their place. What is he saying here? He's saying, yeah, one day, right now, the nation of Israel, they're sojourning, you know, and yes, they come into the promised land, but he's still making it a point that, that our life here is a, t is a temporary journey, right? And he's saying, hey, one day he will plant them and they shall dwell in their place. There's going to be a place one day where they will be planted and then they will not move. They will, they will live there forever, right, his people. And this is obviously prophetic about the end times and things that happen later on. And shall be moved no more, neither shall the children of wickedness waste them any more, as at the beginning, and since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel. Moreover, I will subdue all thine enemies. Furthermore, I tell thee that the Lord will build thee a house. So he's saying, hey, you want to build me a house, the cedar? God's saying, no, I'm the one that's going to build you a house. And it shall come to pass when thy days be expired, that thou must go to be with thy fathers, that I will raise up thy seed after thee, which shall be of thy sons, and I will establish his kingdom. Now, who do you think he's talking about here? Like for us, he's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, right? The son of David. He's raising up a seed. He's going to establish his kingdom forever. He shall build me a house, and I will establish his throne forever. I will be his father. He shall be my son, and I will not take my mercy away from him as I took it from him that was before thee. He's talking about Saul. But I will settle him in mine house and in my kingdom forever, and his throne shall be established forevermore. According to all these words and according to all this vision, so did Nathan speak unto David. So you see, like, why did God choose a tent? Because it was to remind people that, that it was temporary, that wherever they set up this tabernacle, they weren't going to be living there forever, right? So it was, it was like a sort of, um, it was moving with them as they needed to move. Whereas one day he's going to plant them in the land, they're not going to be moved, and then there will be a temple. So there is obviously a temple in heaven. David had a heart to build it for the Lord, I guess, prematurely. Right? So here's where David is uh, sort of, he, he says this to Solomon as well in an earlier chapter, but here he's sort of like announcing it as he wants uh, Solomon to build this, uh, this house. Look at what David says. So this is, this is where none of this was actually said to David. Like, we saw what God said to David, right? And here's how David took it. David assembled all the princes of Israel, the princes of the tribes, and the captains of the companies that ministered to the king by course, and the captains over the thousands, captains over the hundreds, and the stewards over all the substance and the possessions of the king. So you see he's gathered everyone together because, you know, he's, he's making this announcement. And of his sons with the officers and with the mighty men and with all the valiant men on Jerusalem. Then David the king stood up upon his feet and said, Hear me, my brethren and my people. As for me, I had in mine heart to build an house of rest for the ark of the covenant of the Lord and for the footstool of our God and had made ready for the building. So you see how because he thought Solomon's going to build it, what did David do? He basically like drew up all the plans, got like all the equipment, sat it all ready. It's just like Ikea furniture for like Solomon. It's all ready for you to build. You know? But God said unto me, Thou shalt not build an house for my name, because thou hast been a man of war and has shed blood. So you see, like, did God say that too? See, this is what David thought. Oh, this is, I think this is what I think, right? That David, this is what David thought. Oh, I've been a man of war, I've shed blood. That's why God's letting, letting, not letting me build it, right? Howbeit the Lord God of Israel chose me before all the house of my father to be king over Israel forever. For he had chosen Judah to be the ruler, and of the house of Judah, the house of my father, and among the sons of my father, he liked me to make me king over all Israel. And of all my sons, for the Lord hath given me many sons, he hath chosen Solomon, my son, to sit upon the throne of the kingdom of the Lord over Israel. And he said unto me, Solomon thy son, he shall build my house and my court. So you see, like, did he say that? He didn't say, hey, Solomon's going to build it. He just said, yeah, your seed's going to build it. And he's thinking, oh, well, Solomon has taken the throne. He must be talking about Solomon. For I have chosen him to be my son, and I will be his father. Moreover, I will establish his kingdom forever, if he be constant to do my commandments and my judgments as at this day. Now, therefore, in the sight of all Israel, the congregation of the Lord, and in the audience of our God, 
keep and seek for all the commandments of the Lord your God, that ye may possess this good land and leave it for an inheritance for your children after you forever. And thou, Solomon, my son, know thou the God of thy father and serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind, for the Lord searcheth all hearts and understandeth all imaginations of the thoughts. If thou seek him, he will be found of thee, but if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. Take heed now, for the Lord hath chosen thee to build an house for the sanctuary. Be strong and do it. Right. So this is David charging Solomon to build the temple. So that's a bit of history about the tabernacle, what it was and why it got replaced as a temple. I don't think God intended it, but hey, it was built and God still blessed David's work and still used it as he used the tabernacle previously. Now let's get on to Bezalel. Bezalel's purpose. Bezalel's purpose. Why was Bezalel given his talents and abilities? Well, in Exodus 31, let's read a bit about Bezalel here. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding. So notice, the title of the sermon is Bezalel's God-given talents. Right? So I'm making it clear here that, hey, the talents that Bezalel had were actually given to him by God. This is what God is saying here. Hey, he filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship. So it's not that he just gave him knowledge about God. The skills that Bezalel had were given by God. Right? This is why he had these skills, these talents, these abilities to devise cunning works, to work in gold and in silver and in brass and in cutting of stones to set them in, and in carving of timber to work in all manner of workmanship. And I, behold, I have given with him Aholiah, the son of Ahissamach. So notice that not only did God give Bezalel specific talents and abilities, but he also put people in Bezalel's life to, you know, for, you know, to, to, to further these talents and abilities and to use them for the Lord. Of the tribe of Dan, and in the hearts of all that are wise-hearted, I have put wisdom, that they, why? That they may make all that I have commanded thee. The tabernacle of the congregation, and the ark of the testimony, and the mercy seat that is thereupon, and all the furniture of the tabernacle, and the table and his furniture, and the pure candlestick with all his furniture, and the altar of incense, and the altar of burnt offering with all his furniture, and the laver and his foot, the cloths of service, and the holy garments for Aaron the priest, and the garments of his sons to minister in the priest's office, and the anointing oil and sweet incense for the holy place, according to all that I've commanded thee, shall they do? You kind of think, man, is, this, is there anything these guys can't make? Their furniture, it's clothing, perfumes, incense, all sorts of things. So, I mean, they had a lot of wisdom given to them by God. Now think about this. I'm sure that Bezalel made a great living making furniture. I'm sure, you know, maybe you had like, you know, maybe somebody one day can make a company, Bezalel Industries. It's like, you know, you make all sorts of different things and make a lot of money. I mean, I'm sure he did very well as a carpenter or as a, uh, as a smith or, you know, all the stuff that he was making. But let me ask you, was that the reason why he was given those abilities? No. But sometimes people, they, they have a talent, they have an ability, and they think, oh, you know, my calling is to, to do this, you know, big thing, which maybe you can do. But what I don't want you to forget this morning, that the reason why you have these talents and abilities is to use them for the service of the Lord. And the question is, are you using those talents and abilities to serve the Lord, because they weren't given to you just to serve yourself, to make money for yourself so that you can have a comfortable life and you can have all the pleasures and the riches and the cares of this life and all the thorns that choke the word that you become unfruitful, right? The idea of these talents and abilities, what was the main purpose of it? I mean, God gave Bezalel these talents and abilities for the purpose to serve him. Now, if we use these talents and abilities to make a living for ourselves, of course, right? We have to provide. That's part of our responsibilities. But that is not the main purpose. So really, it comes down to who are you serving? Are you serving yourself with the talents and abilities that God gave you? 
or are you serving the true and living God, the one you're meant to be serving, with your talents and abilities? So not only that, right, that's why he was given them, but notice he was also told to teach others the talents and abilities that he had, that they would also use them to serve the Lord as well. And Moses said unto the children of Israel, we read this in the, the Bible reading, See, the Lord hath called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and he hath filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom, in understanding, and in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship, to buy his curious works. Uh, um, and in the cutting, I'll, I'll skip over for sake of time, it's cutting of stones, and all that. we'll go to verse 34. And he hath put in his heart, look at this, that he may teach both he and Aholiab, the son of Ahissamach, of the tribe of Dan, that he hath, uh, them hath he filled with wisdom of heart to work all manner of work of the engraver and of the cunning workman and of the embroiderer in blue and in purple and in scarlet and in fine linen and of the weaver, even of them that do any work and of those that devise cunning work. So you see how God, he says it multiple times where he's filled Bezalel with this wisdom and to be able to devise these things. And what I want you to consider this morning is, hey, you were given these talents and these abilities to serve God, right? So make sure they are being used for that purpose, right? Yeah, you can make a good living with your talents and abilities, but how are you using them to serve God? I mean, what are some examples? You know, you can be like Bezalel and, you know, maybe you're in construction and you may use those abilities to help build certain things or construct certain things. You know, sometimes when a church, you know, maybe has a new place, you know, and they move into a building and some construction needs to make, take place. I mean, those people that are in the construction industry should come together like here and get to work and help the house of the Lord to build something for the Lord. Uh, maybe you have musical abilities and you say, hey, well, you know, I'm, I'm an entertainer. I sing at the local restaurant or, you know, I'm, t I'm teaching music. I'm teaching this. You just need to remember that's not your end goal. That's not your end purpose. That may make you a living. That may, may be something you're doing while you're on this earth. But how are you using those talents and abilities for the Lord? You know, maybe you can write some, some beautiful Christian hymns. You can write some beautiful Christian music and, you know, bless others with that music. Or, you know, music can be used in a lot of uh, you know, different forms of content these days. You know, it's always, always hard to find, like, really nice, like, soundtracks and background music and things like that. So there are ways that people can use their musical abilities to further the kingdom of God. Uh, what about people skills? You say, hey, I'm like, I'm a, you know, people, obviously, if you're a man and you're a public speaker, you can speak. You know, you can use that to preach the word of God. You, know, you have good people skills. You know, you can help people to make them feel more welcome. You know, you use these skills to help spread the gospel, help make people make, make, feel them, help them to feel more welcome, you know, in the community and in the body of Christ. Uh, culinary ability. What's that? Like cooking where, you know, obviously we have the sides and things like that. But it's not only at church where it's like, hey, that's the only place you can use it to serve God. You know, sometimes when people are sick, sometimes when people, you know, uh, you know give birth and, you know, you have the, the ability to cook, you can have, be a blessing to somebody and help them and, and cook them a meal and, you know, ha have people over and cook them uh, some, some food. Uh, maybe you have IT experience, you know, work with computers, you know, web development, all that sort of stuff. You can use those skills um, to help the church, to help the kingdom of God. You know, graphic design, marketing skills. You know, maybe it's administrative skills, just bookkeeping or keeping accounts or just keeping track of things. Maybe you're really good at, at organizing things. Right? And you say, hey, you know, for my work, I like organize a lot of events and I coordinate all these things. And it's like, well, do you do that for God? You know, why not organize a social event, organize a camp, organize something where, you know, you're doing something for the Lord and helping to build up the church and edify God's people. Maybe your strength is in being a compassionate person, you know, where you can provide like a shoulder to cry and an ear to listen to, you know, you can, you can be a support to people that are struggling. So these are just some examples. This is not an exhaustive list, but my point is that everyone has different ways that they can serve the Lord. And really what I want you to reflect on this morning, are you using it in some way to serve God, not just for your own gain? Colossians 1.16, look what it says here. For by him were all things created 
that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. Now watch this last bit. All things were created by him this and for him. They were created by him and for him. Now, you may say to yourself, well, you know, what if I don't have these kinds of talents? You know, I, don't, Victor, I don't have any ability. Well, I don't think that's true because everybody knows how to do something, right? Everyone's got, you know, you know, you know most people, you know, eyes, ears, legs, you can talk, you know. You can do something. Everyone is able to do something. But, you know, if at, if at the very least, I mean, just being present makes a difference. And you think like, well, you know, like I don't know how to do anything, but you know, it's just sometimes just being there and being present, being at church, being amongst the people, being one of the many bodies here that make up this church here, that makes a difference as well. I mean, you guys are here this morning and our church is growing a little bit. I mean, that's encouraging to me. And I'm sure I'm not the only one that's feeling this way. I mean, aren't you encouraged? I mean, would you be more encouraged coming to a church and it's just like my family and one other person and that's how some churches start, right? Or would you rather go to a church where you go, there's a lot of new faces, there's more faces coming, there's people that are regulars. I mean, are you not encouraged to come along to a church and people are there and for you, people to say hello to and, you know, it's just there's strength in numbers and it's no different in Christianity. So don't underestimate the impact that you have on church when you're not there, right? Because when you're there, it's encouraging, right? But when you're not there, that encouragement that could be there is not there anymore, right? So don't uh, underestimate just being present. I mean, think about the soul winning. Like people don't think, they think like, well, I don't know how to talk and I'm not sure how to go soul winning. Hey, you know, sometimes if we have like a couple of talkers, if we just have some silent partners to take with us, the silent partners just double the amount of doors we're going to knock that day. You know, that might go from 20 to 40. But you see how just, just being present, just going along and just being there, it makes a difference. And like I said, you know, hey, it's, obviously it's encouraging to me when there's more people in church. I'm sure it's encouraging to you as well. I mean, think about even Jesus. You remember when he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane? I mean, he wanted his disciples to be there with him. So it's not like, it's not like just, you know, if you're, if you're perfect, I mean... You don't need anyone else, you know. I mean, part of life and part of the Christian life is that's why church, God has church, because it's about coming together and having a community and like-minded people and provoking one another unto, to love and good works. And, you know, Jesus in the flesh, you know, he, he desired that as well, but he still did the right thing even when they, you know, fell asleep and, and weren't praying with him in the garden, you know. So, first point about Bezalel, I've got one more. Bezalel's purpose. He was not given those abilities just to serve himself. He was given those talents and abilities to serve God. And I don't want you guys to forget that as you go about your lives because sometimes, you know, you get caught up in your career. You get caught up in your job. You get caught up saying, oh, you know, I'm on this earth to do, you know, sometimes the talent and ability becomes an end in and of itself. And you need to remember that it's not right that's a means to an end which is to help build the house of the lord the other thing i want to say about bezalel is bezalel's obedience bezalel's obedience look at what how bezalel went about it right so it's not like hey he had all these talents and abilities and he was told to build the house and the tabernacle and all the instruments a certain way and he said you know what i'm just gonna do it my way i don't, I don't like the way god does it you know i'm gonna do it my way i'm gonna make it look the way i like it and all this sort of stuff. But when God has given specific ways to do things, we don't ignore that. Right? So part of Bezalel's righteousness and his, you know, the fact that he is uh, uh, commended in the Bible is he not only had the talents and abilities and used them for the Lord when he was called by God to come and build all the work and teach all the other people to help them build the work as well, he did it exactly as Moses commanded. According to all that the Lord commanded Moses, so the ch children of Israel made all the work. And Moses did look upon all the work, and behold, they had done it as the Lord had commanded. Even so had they done it, and Moses blessed them. So you see how they did it exactly as 
they were commanded. You know, some people, um, you know, some Christians even, I know this is something that the world always says, the Christians take on this philosophy as well, and they shouldn't. They'll say things like, hey, as long as your heart's in the right place, you know, and yeah, there are some instances in Christianity where it is a matter of the heart. You know, sometimes it's the heart of the matter, it's a matter of the heart. But we should not use this sort of phrase and these sayings to disregard what God has said. You know, because even though people are, you know, doing the wrong thing, you know, like you see like in some churches, you know, they keep like bowing down to statues. It's like we're not meant to bow down to statues, but it's like, well, as long as their heart's in the right place. You know, they do, do things that are like contrary to the word of God, or they believe something that's contrary to the word of God, but it's like, oh, but it's fine because their heart's in the right place as long as they've got the right intentions. No, no. When you're disobeying God, your heart is never in the right place. You know, your heart's not in the right place if it's disobeying God, right? And we've all heard the saying. We've heard the saying, like, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. You know, so people always have good intentions, but intentions are not supreme. What does the Bible teach us in 1 Samuel 15? That obedience is actually better than sacrifice. Look at the story of uh, Saul here in 1 Samuel 15. A lot of you may be familiar with the story. It says here, And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. So what was he commanded to do? He was actually commanded to go and basically wipe out this nation, the Amalekites, right, and leave nothing, right? Samuel said, what meaneth then? So he's, so he's basically, so Samuel has now come to Saul, right? And Saul sort of confidently says to, to Samuel, blessed be thou, the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. So he thinks that he's obeyed God. And Samuel said, what meaneth then this bleating of the sheep in mine ears and the lowing of the oxen, which I hear? It's like, because he's saying, God commanded you to kill everything. It's like, why am I hearing sheep? Why am I hearing oxen? If you're telling me you've obeyed the Lord. And Saul said, they have brought them from the Amalekites. For the people spared the best of the sheep. Oh, so you mean you, you disobeyed God here. People spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God. And the rest we have utterly destroyed. So you see how he's trying to justify it there? It's like so saying, hey, we're not keeping it for ourselves. We, we just disobeyed God here, but because we wanted to give it to God. It's like, why let it go to waste? You know, like, so you see how he had good intentions. But look at how Samuel responds. Then Samuel said unto Saul, Stay, and I will tell thee what the Lord hath said to me this night. And he said unto him, Say on. And Samuel said, When thou was little in thine own sight, so what is he saying here? When you are humble, Right? What happened to Saul? He became proud, didn't he? Was thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel, and the Lord anointed thee king over Israel? And the Lord sent thee on a journey and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil, and didst evil in the sight of the Lord? So isn't that interesting that even though he had good intentions and he said, yeah, but we're keeping them to offer to the Lord. And Samuel says, hey, you did evil in the sight of the Lord. And Samuel said, and, and Saul said unto Samuel, yeah, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. He, he, so he still doesn't get it. He, he thinks that he's obeying. And have gone the way which the Lord sent me and have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, Amalek and have utterly destroyed the Amalek. But the people took of the spoiled sheep and oxen, chief of the things, which should have been utterly destroyed, to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. Right? So they're trying to give something back to God. Why destroy it all? Samuel said, hath the Lord... And this is where, um, you know, this is the lesson for, for us Christians, right? Samuel said, hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? He's saying, does he need your stuff? You know, he would rather, he wants you to obey him. That's more important to him than what you give to him. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. And to hearken, what does that mean? To hear, right? To hearken, to, to listen and obey. Then the fat of rams, I was talking about animal sacrifice. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness 
He says, iniquity and idolatry. Oh, so those are pretty tough words, right? Especially for somebody who had good intentions. They're saying, hey, we want to keep to give back to the Lord. But he's saying, no, hey, this rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Why? Because you, why is it idolatry? Because you're not serving God when you're disobeying him, right? Who are you serving? Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. So that was his punishment for not obeying him in that instance right so obey is better than sacrifice so let's apply it to some examples today right here's some maybe i'll hit home with some of you trying to trying to think when i'm writing these sermons i'm like what are all the sins that people do my church now, now hey these are just things that every christian does and i've done them before and stuff like that but here are some common ones skipping church to spend time with or provide for loved ones isn't that a common one? People will justify in their mind, yeah, but Sundays I gotta spend time with the family. Or Sundays I gotta work because I, I gotta pay for the house, I gotta provide for them. I'm doing what God told me to do. And you know what God, one thing God obey, commanded you to do? Don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And yet some people will justify skipping church for doing other things that are that may be good, they have good intentions. But that's a good example. What's another one? What about coming to church with the wrong heart? Right? So you have the wrong heart. Well, hey, one of the commandments of God, hey, we need to love God with all heart, mind, soul, and strength. Hey, like we read at the beginning in Psalm, the beginning of, of church, I was glad when they said unto me, let's go into the house of the Lord. But people will come to church, so it's kind of like, oh, I'm giving my presence, but they're not really obeying the Lord in the heart. Right? What's another one? Like maybe making, I mean, and this is on the same sort of, uh, sort of uh, uh, stream as, uh, you know, doing something with love, you know, because that's one of the things we're commanded to do, right? Love is when you do what's best for other people. You're loving other people. You're treating others like you treat yourself. What about making food for someone, but not putting in a good effort? And that may be like, you know, maybe, you're, you know, you're just making somebody a meal because you're thinking like, um, you know, some people, they have the wrong motivations, right? They think, oh man, everyone else makes it. I better make it because uh, I don't want people to think, what, think these things of me. Or, you know, they make something, they go to the shop, and it's like, you know, normally they would buy like the nice, you know, grass-fed, organic meat. And then it's like, oh, hey, look, this means it's like on special. It's still not over, do you? Yeah, yeah, this one for them. It's like, hey, maybe you get that for you. It's fine. You treat others like you treat yourself. But my point is, you know, are you doing these things with love? You know, when, you, when you do something for God, or you do something for God for somebody else, do you do it with the right sort of love that you do it for yourself? And that's what God has commanded of you. What about just being too busy, right? Too busy to read your Bible. Too busy to pray. Too busy to be involved in church. Too busy to preach the gospel. I mean, these are things that God has commanded you to do. And some people think, yeah, but I'm, I'm busy, like, working. You know, God is wants me to do those things as well and provide, but you're disobeying in other areas. You can't make up for one by disobeying in the other, right? There are some things we are commanded to do. So we talked about giving. What about this? I mean, this is a perfect example, right? Where people give money to the church, right? But they're not ever involved themselves. And they think that, yeah, well, you know, as long as I'm giving to the church, other people can, you know, help with the cleaning, help in all the ministries, help with soul winning, you know, and I'm just giving. I mean, that's, that's a great example of where people are just giving something to God, but to obey is better than sacrifice. Like, God wants you involved, right? So, those are some examples, right? And I'm sure, you know, if you think about it, you could think of some more. But... These are some common ways that Christians kind of justify like, things they give to God, but they don't do it necessarily in the right way or they're disobeying in other areas. Philippians 3, look at what it says here. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Jesus. The last thing I just want to finish on this point is, you know, don't have an attitude of being content with the minimum. You know, sometimes Christians in their Christian life, they kind of think, hey, what's the minimum I need to do? Or they say, hey, what do I need to do just to like 
do enough and I've sort of done my obligation. All right? The Bible says here we want to press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So the question is not, hey, what do I need to do? The question is, hey, what can I do for the Lord? And, um, you know, we want to follow after Bezalel's example. You don't want to be just content with just doing the minimum in Christianity. Right? The way I hope you think of me, like in terms of, like hopefully you think of me as like, hey, you know, Victor, he knows the Bible. You know, Victor's trying to be, trying to follow God. He's trying to do the right thing. You know, respected amongst the church community. That way you think of me, hopefully, is the way God wants people to think of you right so the way the way you think of like other leaders in the faith and you have that respect for them i believe god also wants other people to think of you that way and you can if you take after bezalel's example what is that you use your talents and abilities to serve god right and you are, you are obedient like bezalel okay so closing thought <clears throat> last thought 1 Corinthians 3 verse 11 for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid which is Jesus Christ now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones wood, hay, stubble every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is if any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So I wanted just to end on this analogy that we see in 1 Corinthians 3, that our life, we are like building a building. And the foundation is Jesus Christ, and no matter even if you build nothing on this foundation, the Bible says, hey, he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. But we build with different materials, don't we? We build with either gold, silver, and precious stones. I mean, these things are things that can abide the fire. They represent things that have eternal value. But wood, hay, and stubble represents things that have temporary value and that when God tries our works, right, those will be burnt up. These are the things that are temporary. So what I want you to think about is what are you building for God? What are you building on this foundation? You know, are you building gold, silver, and precious stones? Because you will be if you're like Bezalel, you know, using your talents to serve the Lord and, you know, helping to build the house of God, right? But if you're only serving yourself, you're only doing things for this temporary period, then you're building wood, hay, and stubble, right? So what are you building? That's sort of the theme of today with Bezalel's God-given talents. So who was Bezalel? He led the tabernacle building project, he was somebody that was given talents and abilities. Why? Not to serve himself, but to serve God. And he was obedient to God. So I hope, uh, you know, this sermon, now you know who Bezalel is, and hopefully we will all be more like Bezalel moving forward. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. I just thank you, Lord, for the, the example of Bezalel. It's just an example in the Bible that really speaks to me, and it's a, it's a great reminder that, you know, the talents and abilities that we have, Lord, may we all... Uh, reflect on hey how can we how can i use the things that i know how to do well or the things that i'm able to do to um, help build the house of god so i pray lord that each and every one of us would reflect on that and lord that may we be obedient in the way bezalel was so i pray lord for the people here and, and pray that you would use them lord i pray that as a, as a church i pray that we would be like the nation of israel that we would all come together be more than enough to do a great work for you. And uh, we just uh, help, help us, Lord, to do that. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.